Uh, and they believe that if the underdeveloped countries, or sort of called third world countries, would emulate the economic practices of first world countries, then those third world countries would eventually come along and prosper. So, in essence, many of these folks believe that the way to bring the third world into the first world is for the third world to replicate the kinds of economic practices and institutions uh, that the first world has already put into motion. Now, many social scientists and activists, however, are skeptical of this idea. For example, you may have heard of this Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, Joseph Stiglitz. Joseph Stiglitz. So, Stiglitz argues that the World Bank uh, and other economic organizations have imposed policies on developing countries that put those countries at a tremendous disadvantage. So here's an example. Mozambique. Mozambique has uh, foreign debt that is now 4.5 times higher than their GNP gross national product. So their debt is four times higher than their gross national product uh, for, years, for years on end. So this means that the amount of money that the Mozambique government owed to foreigners is four and a half times more than the value of the goods and services that they produce in a given year. So this is a huge problem. Uh, facing this economic crisis, Mozambique sought relief from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Well, the International Monetary Fund proposed that Mozambique spend twice as much as its education budget uh, on interest payments and debt service. So the, so the IMF said, look, we'll lend you this, these funds, but only on the provision that you are going to pay us back in interest and debt service twice as much as your education budget, and guess what? Four times as much as your health budget. So this doesn't really sound very fair, does it? Uh, in effect, some say the IMF imposed these kinds of crippling debt service policies on Mozambique, which then mean ultimately over time that there's no way that Mozambique can ever get out of a particular situation of indebtedness, uh, and that the health of its people and the education of its people is only going to erode. So some people see that as a part of neoliberal globalization, where these kind of rationalized banking policies that come from the West are imposed on countries that simply don't have the, the financial wherewithal uh, to comply to those terms or to, you know, to pay back. But again, the issue is complicated here because in a certain sense, uh, neoliberal policies and like the moving of manufacturing into third world countries uh, it does benefit some people in those third world countries. In fact, some people prefer a life in the factory to a life in the village. Uh, there's a documentary recently where uh, a woman was talking about working in the village in a, in a third world country. And she says working in the village, she worked from dawn until dusk. She did all day long house, uh, household chores, taking care of children, feeding them, uh, feeding the animals. In the factory, she earns less than a dollar a day. She sews pockets on men's shirts. Yet because work in the factory is a bit less arduous, and it pays something, and it holds out the hope that maybe someday she could, or her children, will do even better, so local folks are in some ways on board with bringing in manufacturing, and are in fact quite positive about it. Uh, so these transnational corporations sensing this, they open up branch plants uh, and attract people to work at incredibly low wages uh, who are more than willing to do it. So in Mexico, a wage of $2 an hour is actually pretty good uh, relative to other kinds of work in Mexico. And workers rush to fill these jobs. Now, the other side of globalization and, and the globalization of labor, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is that oftentimes, the profits and the revenue of the products that are produced in a given country are not put back into the 
infrastructure and are not used to support the health and welfare of the local people, including their education system, their health system, and even just their uh, the basic environmental conditions. Again, what seems to matter most here are the, um, the stockholders and financial self-interest in the end, not the actual local country in which these products are being made. So one of the negative impacts, you heard it in that protest uh, of, of globalization, is that, in a sense, the environment is being butchered. So particularly in third world countries, where there are lush countrysides, um, trees are being clear cut, resources are being drilled out of the ground, uh, and there's very little consideration for the local environment, for um, sanitary conditions in which people live nearby these facilities. And again, the high value components of these industry industries are typically not produced in these plants, but rather they're imported to first world countries. And then of course, also you've heard of a sweatshop. And you know that in some of these third world countries, uh, there's tremendous exploitation of workers, not just cheap labor, but also the exploitation of child labor. Eight, nine, ten-year-old kids going off and working 12 hours a day in a hot vacuum. Um, the conditions themselves in the factory can be unsafe. Every now and then you hear on the global news about a factory burning down and killing like hundreds and hundreds of people, right? Because there weren't proper uh, fire codes. So I offer you these sort of two different aspects of the globalization of labor because I want to introduce to you the tension that comes about here. It's not a simple, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of simply shut down um, the globalization and say, oh, so it's not fair to bring over these very low paying manufacturing positions and throw them down on a third world country because in fact, if the country itself that receives this manufacturing does benefit in some ways. Workers get money, they may prefer to uh, village life, uh, there's hope for some sort of future prosperity for the children, uh, the tax base increases in the local host country, so it's complex. Okay, now I want to, with all of that said, I want to step back and take a very broad kind of historical view on globalization and give you a theory, a very prominent theory, that uh, tries to tell us about how politics has worked, politics and power work throughout this thing we call uh, globalization. And to do that, I'm going to turn to world systems theory. World systems theory, which was developed by this 20th century sociologist, Emmanuel Wallerstein. You see Wallerstein on the right. Do you know who's on the left? Big Daddy. Someone say Big Daddy? I like that. Big Daddy's on the left. If you don't know who's on the left, you will need to retake the course. Okay. So, Wallerstein uh, starts with Marx and starts with Marx's assumption that one of the most important dimensions of any given society is the mode of production and the relations of production. If you know what is produced, and if you know who produces it, and what are the structural positions within that mode of production, or what we call the relations of production, owners and workers would be like the crudest example of relations of production in capitalist economies, owners and workers. Well, if you know the mode of production and the relation to production, Marx tells us, you then can understand a great deal about how power works in a given society. So Wallerstein picks up on this insight. But unlike Marx, Wallerstein looks at relations of production, not just within a given country, but he looks at, in a sense, owners and workers across the world and begins to think about the possibility of talking about an owning class and a working class throughout the world. Uh, so he moves beyond the boundaries of the nation state, which Marx largely stayed within, 
and look instead to the international system by which one country relates to another country uh, in a single system, a world system, a, a kind of global mode of production. So Wallerstein uh, argues that the history of, mo of the modern world is characterized by a deep division of labor. And this division of labor is not between just workers and owners within a given country. The division of labor is global. And it operates between countries around the globe. Now, within this division of labor, some countries have very highly developed economies, like the US, Canada, Western Europe. And he calls those countries the core. They're part of the core of the world system. Uh, other countries with less developed economies are part of either the semi-periphery or the periphery. Semi-periphery or periphery. The poorest countries with the least developed uh, economies are the periphery. Somewhere in between the core and the periphery are the semi-periphery. You almost could think about it as first world, second world, and third world where first world represents the core, second world represents the semi-periphery, and third world countries represent the periphery of the global system. So Wallerstein then analyzes how the economies of the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery relate to one another. And what he sees in these relations between the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery are structures of domination whereby the periphery countries, or the very poor countries, are subordinated to the core countries, or first world countries. And that subordination comes about as a function of dependence. There's a dependent relationship of the peripheral countries to the core countries. So dependence is, uh, economic dependence becomes a huge problem. So Wallerstein theorized a world system that's developed, which traps periphery countries in cycles of impoverishment and underdevelopment, while rewarding the core countries with the re resources and surplus wealth that's taken out of the periphery. So most of you just talk about the next time. You could kind of use that as a case to fit into Wallerstein's world systems theory. Mozambique has a lot of natural resources that are mined, uh, and the, the products of which uh, are then sold on the market, and the profits which go largely to uh, North American and Western European business owners, stockholders, and corporations. Mozambique is left with not so great environmental conditions, very low paid, paid workers, and as, and as a matter of course, increasing debt, which they then have to go to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to pay off. So most of it becomes dependent, increasingly so, on first world countries and on, and on these global financial institutions in order to survive within the world system. But in doing so, it just gets itself into worse debt uh, with environmental destruction and the erosion of uh, of social institutions. So there's a relation of dependence and ultimately of erosion uh, within the system, with the core, uh, core nations and the citizens profiting quite a bit, uh, and the periphery or the third world countries that are uh, down the toilet. So I have a little video because you're probably tired of hearing my voice, I certainly am. And uh, this is going to tell us a little bit about the world system theory. Another professor's perspective. So listen up, very interesting stuff. Sure to make this guy something. Okay. 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 First thing I'd like to discuss with you now is the legacy of colonialism. Now colonialism is defined as how foreign power maintains political, social, economic, and cultural domination for an extended period of time over a group of people or a country, in simple terms, colonialism is ruled by outsiders. Relations oftentimes between the colonial nation and the colonized people are very similar to relationships that are described 
in class terms between the dominant capitalist class and the proletariat. Uh, this is very reminiscent of the work of Karl Marx when he talked about the haves and the have-nots. Now, by the 1980s in the world, traditional colonization, colonialism, had pretty much disappeared. Most of the nations that had been colonies prior to, say, World War I, had achieved some sort of political independence and had established their own governance. And the way that that occurs is the colonizing nation had swooped in and set up a government in these countries. And after a period of time when these nations decided that they no longer needed to be in the country, for whatever reasons, whether that was they no longer needed the labor resource, they no longer needed natural resources, they largely just sort of left, and they left the country to set up its own government and to try and fix many of the problems that had been inherent in the colonial systems of the past. Colonial domination established some patterns of economic exploitation in a lot of these countries that continued on even after they achieved their own nationhood. And part of the reason for that is because some of these nations had never been allowed to develop their own infrastructure, develop their own industry and technology, and they had become very dependent on the countries that had come in to colonize them what we would refer to as colonial masters, basically. So when the colonists moved out, it caused a continuing dependence and foreign domination, which today we refer to as neo-colonialism, the continued dependence on more industrialized nations for managerial and technical expertise by the former colonies. And this is a pretty common occurrence with countries that were once colonized. So whether we're actually talking about colonialism or neo-colonialism, it's important to note that the economic and political consequences are very real. Sociologist Emmanuel Wallerstein has done a lot of work in this area, and he has what he termed world systems analysis, which is a perspective or a theory, which says that there are unequal economic and political relationships in which certain industrialized nations, among those the United States, and their global corporations, still continue to dominate at the core of the world system. At the semi-periphery of this system would be countries that have somewhat marginal economic status. Uh, they're kind of in the middle. They're not a dependent country necessarily. However, they do depend on the assistance of those core nations at times. The countries that fall into this category would be South Korea, India, Mexico. Um, and then there's a third category, the peripheral nations. The peripheral nations of the world are still in an exploitative relationship to the core nations. And the core nations and their corporations often control and exploit the non-core nations' economies, natural resources, and labor pools. So the division between core and periphery nations is significant, and it's a very stable relationship. And what I mean by stable relationship is, once you find a place in one of these categories, it's extremely challenging to move yourself out. The core nations have pretty much been the core nations for decades, if not a few centuries. Uh, the semi-peripheral nations, however, we have had some countries that have lifted themselves from the periphery into that semi-peripheral state, it will be challenging indeed for those semi-peripheral nations, however, to bump up into the core nation category, with the exception of a couple of nations. I would have to say that China and India are probably the two that would be most readily poised to move themselves up into a core nation category. And the largest reason for this is the development of an infrastructure industrialization, and the size of their population. They have so many people to contribute to a workforce in those countries that that will very rapidly help them to uh, overcome their semi-critical status and maybe move into that core nation ranking. So Wallerstein kind of speculated that the system that we currently understand it will undergo some changes as the world becomes increasingly urbanized. 
once we do become ur urbanized, we will actually start to eliminate the large pools of low-cost workers that live today in rural areas. And so in the future, poor nations are going to have to find other ways to reduce labor costs. So we're exhausting land, we're exhausting resources such as water through clear cutting and pollution, we're driving up the cost of production, and we're also depleting our labor source. Uh, this has some serious ramifications for quote unquote business as we know it uh, on the world labor market. Wallerstein's world systems analysis is a very widely used theory that falls under the broader spectrum of what we call dependency theories. So dependency theories in general talk about developing countries, even while making economic advances, will remain subservient and weak to poor nations and large corporations. And I think there is a lot of truth to Wallerstein's uh, assumptions and to dependency theories in general. And you really can't see that it is a conflict type of theory. The interdependency of industrialized nations allows them to continue to exploit developing countries, the industrialized nations playing roles of the bourgeoisie or the haves, and the developing countries playing the role of the proletariat or the have-nots. So what's actually happening here with regard to natural resources in the world? A growing share of the human resources and the natural resources of developing countries is actually being shifted. It's being redistributed to the core industrialized nations. This happens because developing countries go into debt to core nations as a result of foreign aid, loans, trade deficits, etc. And when that happens and the developed nations start to call in their markers, one of the ways in which they can pay us back is by allowing corporations to exploit the workers and the natural resources of that country. So what actually ends up happening in developing nations is, for example, the currencies may be devalued, workers' wages might be frozen, you'll have an increased privatization of industry, and a reduction in government services and employment. Because as the government scrambles to try and pay back the debts they owe to poor nations, they take money away from building their own infrastructure. This is problematic for those dependent countries because it puts them in a position of spinning their wheels more or less. They don't really ever get to significantly lift themselves out of the status that they're in because they're caught in a cycle of having to pay the man, basically. All right, I hope this helps you to understand these basic concepts. We'll talk again soon. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she gave us a nice, uh, nice review of Wallerstein and world systems theory or analysis, and she has the dependency on it. Okay, so I want to recap Wallerstein because I think it's so important. So again, according to Wallerstein, Wallerstein goes all the way back to colonialism in seeing an impressive in the, in the relations between nations. So in the dynamics of colonialism, he believes that there were uh, structures of domination that have continued today and have become even more systematic and highly institutionalized in the global markets. So during the time of colonialism, what happened? Colonizers came into a given country, they extracted its resources, they used its labor, sometimes enslaving it, sometimes just paying it very little, uh, and they kept for themselves and their own countries whatever surplus value was derived from those activities. Rather than reinvesting the value of that, of the, of the resources, let's say that were mined, or the trees that were cut, uh, or the cotton that was picked, rather than take resources and the revenue that came from that and invested back in that country's infrastructure, in its health care, in its welfare system, that money instead was just put in the pockets of very wealthy uh, Europeans and, uh, and North Americans.
Uh, and as a, as a consequence, then, the infrastructures and the welfare of those uh, local uh, colonized countries eroded. Now, over time, colonization ends, and these colonized countries develop their own uh, political institutions. But at the same time, there's this history uh, that has greatly disadvantaged them globally. So over the course of globalization, that system of extraction and exploitation has continued, but on a much more massive and systematic scale. So those countries that comprise the core of the world system invest in and ultimately exploit the labor power and resources of the countries in the periphery. And the countries in the periphery are caught in a relation of dependence to the first world uh, for funds uh, and for products and services and technical skills. So what's resulted are poor, underdeveloped, you hear that word, underdeveloped third world countries uh, which are completely dependent on and internally rich uh, poor countries. So to manage their poverty, these poor peripheral countries may seek out uh, assistance from the World Bank and other international financial institutions which impose rates of interest uh, that put these impoverished nations in even greater debt. So it's a cycle of uh, colonization, and resource extraction uh, and uh, the distribution of surplus out of those uh, peripheral countries into the pockets of the capitalist class, if you will, multinational corporations and uh, investors from the core. And then this gets reproduced over and over and over into, um, into these cycles where the core becomes richer and stronger and the periphery weaker and even more dependent. How will this change? That's up to you. I'll see you next week.